My next guest and I have both argued that the power Congress has under the Constitution to regulate interstate commerce was intended to assure that Congress would keep commercial activities between the states regular and not allow the states to erect barriers or, imp or impose tariffs that would help in-state businesses. So why hasn't Congress used this power to let you buy health insurance from outside of your state? Why has it instead regulated everything from conditions in the workplace to what you can grow in your backyard to guns within a thousand feet of schools? And where in the Constitution is Congress authorized to regulate health care or to force people to purchase health insurance? Joining me now is Roger Pallon, the founder and director of Cato's Center for Constitutional Studies. Roger, welcome to Freedom Watch. Well, thank you, Judge. It's good to be with you. Thank you. So uh, Congress will probably hang its hat on the hook of its power under the Commerce Clause, which, loosely paraphrased, gives it the power to regulate interstate commerce. Is that really a legitimate constitutional basis, taking into account the intent of the framers, the reason for which the federal government came into existence, the Ninth and Tenth Amendment, and various other backstops in the Constitution? Was it really the intent of the framers to allow the Congress to regulate your relationship with your physician? Absolutely not. You read the Constitution from beginning to end, and you will not see health care or health insurance anywhere in that document. The way Congress goes about regulating or trying to regulate these things, as you've said, is under its power to regulate interstate commerce. Now, that was held originally to enable Congress to make sure that trade between the states was free and unobstructed because states were erecting tariffs and other such measures to protect local merchants and manufacturers from out-of-state competition. And so the framers gave Congress the power to regulate or make regular, as you put it, the commerce between the states. Unfortunately, the 1937 court, the New Deal court, read that power as giving Congress the power to regulate anything that affects interstate commerce. Well, of course, there's nothing that does not, at some level, affect interstate commerce. So it amounts to a power to regulate anything and everything under the sun. So in one case, for example, where a farmer grew what for the federal government was too much wheat in his backyard, even though it was all consumed by him and his family, or in another case where a person pursuant to a prescription from a physician and under California state law grew marijuana in her backyard, even though in both cases there was no commercial activity and nothing moved from one state to another, the courts both said, or both courts that looked at it said, Congress can regulate the wheat and Congress can regulate the marijuana under the Interstate Commerce Clause. Does that still make sense today? Well, it never made sense from the beginning. The uh, problem is that you've got activities that are neither commerce nor certainly interstate commerce, and yet under this broad reading of the Commerce Clause, this is what we've ended up with. And the courts, unfortunately, have bowed to political pressure. Don't forget, this rereading of the Constitution, this turning of the Constitution on its head, followed Franklin Roosevelt's threat to pack the court with six new members. In other words, it was political coercion of the court, and the court caved. Of course, he then got to appoint eight members himself as people retired or died, and so he probably would have gotten that result anyway. But the problem today at bottom is this. We have a body of law today that's called constitutional law. It's connected to the Constitution itself only occasionally. And so the American people really need to understand how far we have strayed from our origins. Um, about two weeks ago, I was interviewing Congressman Jim Clyburn, who's the number three ranking Democrat in the House of Representatives. He comes from South Carolina. Uh, and I asked him, where in the Constitution is the Congress authorized to regulate health care? And his answer surprised me. It was not the clear, crisp, and, and precisely accurate answer that you gave me, simply nowhere. It was, Judge, most of what we do down here, referring to Washington, is not authorized by the Constitution. Question, Roger Pallon, from the Cato Center for Constitutional Studies. Are, are we so infected with an attitude 
amongst lawmakers of both parties that they think they can write whatever they can get away with, that they literally don't care, don't read, don't understand the document which they have sworn to preserve, protect, and defend? We are in that state of affairs. Don't forget that many of the legislatures, probably most of them, are lawyers. This is what is taught in law school today. You know yourself when you were in law school how the Constitution was taught. Uh, it is encouraging, however, to see the tea parties, the uh, town halls that have uh, taken place in August, and how often the people in those are going back to the Constitution. Uh, I am heartened by that because what these people are crying out for is get off our backs, government. Federal government, you don't have authority under the Constitution to do most of what you're doing today. This is something new, uh, Judge Napolitano. I haven't seen it quite this intense in recent years. It could be that President Obama is himself going to be the catalyst for this resurrection of the original Constitution. Wouldn't that be wonderful? It would be wonderful, and I share fully your observations, uh, Roger, having been uh, present and having been privileged to speak at some of these gatherings. It is, it is amazing and it is gratifying to, to have ordinary folks who are not lawyers, who did not study the Constitution, make very, very prudent arguments about what the original intent of the framers was. Some of that original intent, as, as you pointed out, was to make sure that New Jersey, for example, couldn't say to New York or, Mon or to an insurance company in New York or an insurance carrier in Texas or Montana or Idaho or any one of the other 49 states, you can't do business in New Jersey. But yet New Jersey does, as do all the other states. So why hasn't the Congress destroyed those barriers to interstate commerce? Why can't I, as a resident of New Jersey, buy a piece of a policy from a carrier in Montana and a piece of a policy from a carrier in Idaho and tailor make one to the needs of my family and me? Why am I forced to buy only the Rolls Royce of policies, which is the only policy you can get if you live in New Jersey, from a carrier in New Jersey? I, I expect that part of the reason is that a case has not been brought that would enable the courts to adjudicate in that direction because you don't have discrimination as such one state against the rest of the states. But what this means is that it falls to the political branches to do what the Congress, what the Constitution authorizes them to do. You raise a very good point here, Judge Napolitano, in that the original design of the Commerce Clause was for precisely this purpose, to ensure a free market, a free national market, and that's exactly what this state restriction every state is engaged in amounts to, a restriction on a national market. So Congress should, it could and it should step in to open up the market. But of course, this is not what Congress is doing here. Congress wants to is itself establish this grand health insurance scheme for the whole nation and then compel us all to join it. Roger Pallon, thanks for joining us on Freedom Watch. You're quite welcome.